Ladies and gentlemen, Gene DiNapoli. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli here on Monday, February 1st. We are in the beautiful state of New York, and it is snowing like never before. We are snowed in. Uh, my niece has been home, no school, no work. So it's a trying time for a 53-year-old man to be at home all day with his 23-year-old niece. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so good to be back on the format, speaking about the music I love, uh, Elvis and doo -wop. Uh, but right now we want to talk about our sponsor for the night. Our sponsor for the night is a young lady named Allison who has a wonderful business called Bacon Bits. And Bacon Bits, as you can see right there, is a chocolate and lollipop and cookie um, business. So uh, Allison does a great job and we wanted to promote her. She does a lot of great things. Valentine's Day is coming up. So we want to show you a couple of our items for Valentine's Day. First of all, any one of our packages comes in the small box. We're going to show you a small box. We're going to show you the medium size box, right? And then we're going to show you the large box. She also does hot cocoa bombs, which for anybody that doesn't know what this is, you drop them in hot milk. And they blow up and they come out with marshmallows and candies, which is what I'll be having tonight. And she also does chocolate-covered strawberries. So all of her packages are available in small, medium, and large. We want you to go to her website, which is bacon. That's B-A-K-I-N, bits, B-I-T-Z-N-Y-C, dot com. If you make an order, tell Allison that you saw us here on the Gene DiNapoli podcast because then I get free chocolate-covered strawberries. Yes, I do. Uh, tonight, we want to dedicate our show to two gentlemen who passed away uh, in the past week. One I didn't know too well. Uh, we're talking about the great actor from a TV show called Saved by the Bell, Mr. Dustin Diamond passed away just a few hours to ago. Uh, that's me and Dustin at one of my shows. He was so gracious to come uh, to one of my shows, and he had a blast. And the other is a friend that I've known for 40-some-odd years. My friend Davey D. Fidel passed away just last Wednesday, uh, one day after one of his daughters turned Sweet 16. So we want to dedicate tonight's show to Dustin and Davey, which could have been a singing duo. And there is a GoFundMe page for David's expenses. We will list that in the comments. If you are so inclined to go and make a small donation, because we know everybody is going through some difficult times. Uh, I normally don't ask, but Davy was a special man. His wife, very special. His two children, very special. And we want to wish him a safe journey uh, up to the heavens above. And to Dustin and Davy, God bless you. So, you know, when I started this podcast around tw 21 weeks ago, 21, 22 weeks ago, I interviewed a bunch of friends of mine. Because I didn't think I would be able to get people of stardom. And then I started to get some singers that I knew personally. And they know me for 30, 40 years. And they said, of course, Gene will do anything. And then I started to branch out and um, email people I didn't know. And I said, well, what's the worst they could do? Say no to me. And knock wood, only three or four out of the 50 people I've emailed or messaged have said no. Some due to retirement, some due to um, they're not in the country, and some due to they just don't want to do it for whatever reason. But my show is going to be going on a lot of different platforms, and we just got approved to be put on Roku, which is a streaming service that will make these shows be seen all over the globe. So I 
think in a couple of months, those three or four people that asked, told me they didn't want to be on the show, I think they're going to be calling to be on this show. Because this is one of the most fun shows on the internet. I've gotten so many compliments on on this show, the format of the show, and everything else. Excuse me, my, my green screen is screwed up. That I think that they're going to want to be on this show. Now, for those of you that don't know, can't see, I'm wearing a pink flamingo shirt. And the reason being is that today, ladies and gentlemen, I have on the show a gentleman who has kept a group alive for 60 plus years, which is remarkable because the guy looks 35 years old. And when I'm done with this interview, I'm going to call him up and say to him, what is your secret? Because I want to know how this man looks 30 years old. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get the show on the road and bring in from the original doo group from the early 50s, mid 50s, and still today, say hello to our guest, Mr. Terry Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. Let's bring him in. Hey, hey everybody out there. Hi, Terry. Hey, babe. How you doing? Good? I'm, I'm doing good now that I got you on camera. How are you? I'm doing fabulous, man. You know, I don't know if you, you're doing fabulous, but you look fabulous. Thank uh, you. I'll let the shirt, the emblem on the shirt, I'll let go. I'll let it go. The Oakland Raiders, you know, what are we going to do? We didn't make it this year. But uh, it is so good to have you here. You know, I had a lot of my friends on, Joey D, Larry Chance, Vito Picone. But yeah. I think you are in the uh, genesis of rock and roll history. You know, Joey, uh, hit song 1961, Larry yeah. 62. But yeah. you, you come from the original Big Bang of rock and roll. There was a Chuck Berry, right. my man yeah. Elvis, Fats yeah. Domino, right? right? Yeah. And then you had, then you had the groups. Right. And you, your group, I, I, I really can't, you know, listen, I knew seven or ten of your songs, but over the past week, I've gone back and listened to the anthology, and I can't believe the catalog of music that you guys have done. You know, people say the Dupree's, uh, a great group, Joey Van, they say they took all the movie songs and the standards yeah. and brought them to rock. No, you brought them to rock and roll. At first, yeah. The first. So will you please tell us, you know, we're going to touch on the hits, but sure. I want people to know that the Flamingos were more than just three or four big sellers. So the group originally came out in 53 under a, a couple of names, the Swallows, the El Flamingos, the Five Flamingos. Do you see a bird, a bird connection here, right? right, and, right. And, and it was originated by Jake and Ezekiel Carey, who True. were not related, which not was funny, right? right? So we want to give props to them because at least they started this. Right. And, and then they eventually became the Flamingos. But wait, wait, wait. It was it was more than Jake and Zeke. It was yes. also Paul Wilson and Johnny Carter. Yes. The four of them. They were they I mean Jake and Zeke, they, they had the dream, but they had to meet these other two guys to make that dream come true. Absolutely. And you also had another guy named Earl Lewis. Uh, yep. not not the Earl Lewis of the channels. Right. The Earl and so that was the first incarnation right. of I the didn't, I didn't what? know. Earl. I didn't know Earl. You didn't know. No, no. Okay, but they had some regional success, yep. right? With a song called "If I Can't Have You," not not the disco version, right? Right, right. And then they followed it up, uh, and then Johnny wrote a song called uh, "Golden Teardrops." Golden Teardrops, beautiful. And that brought them to like some people's right. intuition, right? Right. Now, when did that was 53, 54, 55. Yeah, you came in in fifty six. Right. And uh, did you know any of these guys? Yeah, I knew. See, first of all, Jake and Zeke are not from Chicago. They moved to Chicago. They're from Baltimore. That's how I knew them. 
They live in Baltimore, belong to the same synagogue. Wow. They're, they're, they're from Baltimore, and uh, uh, and once they moved to, to Chicago, they, you know, found Paul and Johnny, and they put it together. But I just want to put that straight. They're from Baltimore and moved to Chicago. Okay. Okay, that's great. Well, Baltimore, you know, we got all the Oreos. We got a lot of great things that's come right. out of Baltimore. Crab cakes. We got that. So now uh, they started and they had some regional success, but it wasn't until you got into the group that they started to get a lot of buzz. We went to the pop market once I, I bought in Lovers Never Say Goodbye. Right. That's, we, we, went, we went from the black market into the pop market or the white market. Right. And it really gave us a big shot. Right. And before we go any further, I do want to say that I'm glad you said that because today is the first day of Black History Month. It sure is. And and listen to me. I am I'm Italian. I'm not I'm so I am a man of color. My color is olive. I and come from you know, you know. and I don't believe that sh anybody should have a month. I think the entire year should belong to everybody. I agree. That, that's what I think. Now let's let's not talk. Let's not. <laughs> you don't want to say too much on these podcasts You're because right. you never. But we're going to show you a picture, Anthony. Put up this picture, uh, the first picture, Terry. I don't know if you can see well. So this is the group in 1953. Wow. <laughs> Look at Paul. <laughs> so 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 this is the original incarnation, right? That's in right. In 1953. Yep. Uh, I, I think it's amazing. Uh, everybody looks so young. Were they all they were. in their teens? Uh, probably, yeah. Unbelievable. So they already knew what they wanted to do. Yeah, and that's Sally McElroy. He's the one. He was, he was, he was the first real lead singer. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Recording, right. you know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then the next picture was a is a little important because this is the group uh in 1956 uh, and who is that handsome guy to the right? It must be a guy named Terry Johnson. I don't know. I don't know. So now you joined the group as the guitar lead singer. Right. And first tenor. And first and tenor. Baritone. That's great. Now, we talked about uh, Lovers Never Say Goodbye. Anthony, could you play a little bit of that clip for us? We only play a little bit, Terry, for copyright, but we want our viewers sure. to hear how great. So, Anthony, give us a little bit of Lovers Never Say Goodbye. Please wait. For me For I shall return My love for you Will forever Fabulous. Uh, Terry, is that you on the high part? No, that's me. Please wait for me. So you're saying lead. Turn, I'm saying baritone there. But baritone. On the repeats, I go to first tenor. Right. Oh, my spot. There's no reason to cry. Unbelievable. That's an unmistakable sound. That that's that's just incredible. Now we jumped a little bit ahead. I wanted yeah. to touch base because my my 83 year old father who lives in South Carolina, texted me, and he wanted me to ask you, do you remember when I'll Be Home comes out and Pat Boone covers it? Yes. And Alan Freed tells all the rhythm and blues kids, do not buy any more Pat Boone records if he's going to cover the R&B. Do you remember this? He did. He did. But, but I mean, but, but they did it anyway, you know. Right. So can you say hello to my father, Lou, in South Carolina? Hey, Lou, how you doing? <laughs> Hope everything is all right with you, my friend. He's going to love that. Good. Thank you. So now, uh, night, uh, the next picture is uh, is from a movie. Anthony, picture number three. Uh, this is from the movie Go, Johnny, Go in 1959. Ooh. Yep. 
I mean, the dancing that that we did was phenomenal. We were the leaders of of you know of the of the vocal groups that were doing all these dance steps and and doing the splits and sliding through the legs and a thing called the basketball. I mean, we were the first that did that. So so you're gonna remember this next clip, Anthony. Video number two from the movie Go Johnny Go. Here is. Um, Jump children. That's it. Anthony. Uh, of all of the songs around, sometimes the old one. This Sorry, is not- Anthony. Number three. Four. Sorry. Jumping at the break of day. When the joint starts jumping, it's almost the break of day. When the jo- now, you guys, when people talk about the flamingos, rock and roll, and and you miss those dancing steps. Can uh, you still do them? Sure. Yeah. Right. Sure. I can do so, all of the steps. I so. I only knew the flamingos for being the master of love songs. Did you do a lot of upbeat songs in your shows? Uh, right. Yeah. But 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 the main things that we were recording were love songs, you know, right. Yeah. So uh you were in the group when you also did Alan Freed's movie Rock Rock Rock. I had just gotten in the group then. You just I got just, and that, so that was like your first job. Right. No, no, I, I was not on Rock Rock Rock. You weren't in the group. You weren't I just got in the group, and it, it, it had happened while I was in transition with them. Okay. How old were you when you joined the Flamingos? What do you mean? How old? 18. Okay. Were you were you doing anything else besides music? 17 or 18. I'm, I'm, you know, this so long ago, man. <laughs> 17 or 18. Um, were, you going- were you a career... Did you want to do this as a career, or oh, were you? Oh, yeah, from day one. Day one. From day one. I went to the Royal the- Royal Royal Theater in Baltimore, and saw Sonny telling the Orioles. And once I saw this guy singing and bending over and putting an expression in the song, and he lived right down the street from me anyway, I kind of fell in love with wanting to sing, wanting to, you know get into music. So, so really? I. Saw- so I put my own group together in Baltimore called The Whispers. And that was in 1954-55. We recorded four songs of Gotham Records in Philadelphia. And after that, uh, the, the, the records was taken off. But then the Flamingos came in town. And uh, I love the Five Keys also. I'll tell you a little story. I, I really love the Five Keys. They were, they just had it. They just had that look. But then... They won, and I, I, I watched them, and I said, there's my group. And they sang Close Your Eyes and all those good songs. And then the Flamingos came out. When they came out, I'm telling you, this is the truth, Gene. I saw I was sitting out in the audience way back, and I saw myself on stage with them. Just like I'm seeing myself on this video right now. I'm, I saw myself on stage with them. And I went back, I went backstage and told them, what the, I said, I just had a, a weird experience in my life. And they kind of laughed. And Nate asked me, do I know any, uh, do I know anybody that can sing and play an instrument? Because uh, J- Jake, I mean, uh, Johnny Carter and Zeke were just drafted in the army. So I said, well, I play guitar and I sing first tenor and baritone and lead. So they asked me if I would, you know, come in and audition. I said, sure, I'd love to. I went in the next day, took my guitar, my amplifier, and they put the music in front of me. Luckily, I knew how to read it, and they they hired me on the spot. And uh, that's how it started with them. But I was really after the five keys. You know what I mean? I I really liked their sound. But then the flamingos, when I saw them, man, I saw their dancing and how smooth they were. They they had routines, even in ballads. They had nice, smooth, the way they would, you know, everybody moved together. You know, uh, it's been said that the Temptations and Tavares and a lot of those Manhattans, uh, the Delphi took a lot from you guys. Yeah, they did. Uh, because 
There was another group a little bit before you who did the same thing called the Trineas. Oh, my boys. My yes. Hey, man, my, that's my friend. Man, all but of them. They, but they weren't on TV. But 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 they didn't do that kind of dancing. They, they didn't do any splits. They just said, rocking is our business. Right. On a, yeah. So, yeah, we knew them very well. They were great guys. We, yeah. we worked with them with Joey D. Um, yeah. Being that there's a blizzard here in New York, Ooh. I want to play a little bit of video number two because maybe you could sympathize with me now. So, Anthony, video number two. <laughs> yeah. uh, of all of the songs around, sometimes the old ones I think are interesting, especially when they're redone in a different manner. Many of you, I'm sure, will remember this tune. It's a very old song. I only have eyes for you. And to do it, here are the flamingos. <laughs> So you're in a studio, it's August, and you're bumped. You're bundled up. You're bundled up like it's winter. With a real fire in front of us. With a real fire. <laughs> I tell you, the things you guys did back then, especially on bandstand, you know, uh, Johnny Maestro, uh, uh, Bobby Darren singing Splish Splash in a yeah. bad tub. You guys, the, the groups of today, the singers of today have it so easy. I know. They don't know what what what. Cutting their teeth means. Right. You know, so you guys, you take an old standard, which which Sinatra made huge. Yeah. And who came up with the arrangement for I Only Have Eyes for You? I did. Tell us about that, please. Okay. George Golden, I, but because I played the instrument uh, and knew what I was doing and knew, knew harmonies, George Goldner had, uh, he and Richard Barrett had bought me 33 songs and said they want me to change them around and put my own spin on it since they liked the way that Lovers Never Say Goodbye was. And uh, so 33 songs, 32 are knocked out, bam, 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 no problem. But the 33rd song was kick ass. It was like, I didn't like it. I didn't like the way the, the I liked the melody, but I didn't like the, the way the chord structure was. And, it, it didn't have a certain thing that I felt was missing. So I was laying on my bed in the hotel with my guitar on my chest. I have a bad habit of still doing it. <laughs> All of a sudden I fell asleep and I heard, Gene, this is the truth. I heard, come on, come on, come on. I heard the chord structure that I'd used and, and I heard the harmonies, the way that I, I and, and, I heard the whole song, the whole arrangement in my head, and it came from it came from God. It had to because the way the way it came out, and I called the guys right away at four o'clock in the morning. I said, "Come to my room now." <laughs> it's no way, it's no way I can remember this. I need everybody here. They didn't want to come, but they finally came to my room. I showed everybody their parts. Sing this part. You do it. Do it. Do it. Take this. Boom. 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 I showed everybody what to do, and. When I got finished, I was expecting a congratulation. They looked at me like, what the hell is that? No, no. <laughs> they didn't like it. They did not like it. And and I said, well, it's too bad. But, you know, like, I have a deadline. We have a deadline. I have to, so I've got the studio booked for tomorrow. So we're going to be there, and we're going to sing the song. They were like, I, I think that's a mistake. I don't George is going to be pissed off. I said, I don't care. It came from, it came from my spirit. It came from my spirit. So we went to the studio, recorded it, and I thought it was really great. And uh, when George Golden came in town, he called me in the office. He said, Terry, just come in here. I said, hey, George, how you doing? He said, hey, George, my ass. <laughs> Let me ask you something, young man. Who in the hell told you you could go in the studio and record garbage like that? I said, garbage? He said, yes, yeah, garbage. He said, it doesn't sound like 50s music. He said, you know, you're a 50s act, you know, like, 
You, 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 it's just, Terry, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Whatever you do, don't ever go in that studio without my permission, without me being accompanied with you. He said, please. He said, it doesn't sound like 50s music. And I, I'm really pissed off with you, Terry. I said, I'm sorry, but damn, I, I, I said, it came from God. It came from God. Yeah, sure, it came from God. So he said, but I, I'm, I'm going to put it on the album. Flamingo Serenade because I I can't afford to lose my money so maybe you know maybe I can make some of my money back because this song is terrible and about two or three weeks later the DJ started playing Good Night Sweetheart Good Night Sweetheart Till We Meet Tomorrow that's the one that everybody chose but when the DJ heard I only have eyes for you they're like hey hey so and so in Chicago, hey, in, in L.A., hey, so-and-so in Philadelphia, Baltimore, just started spreading like wildfire. And I'll say about two and a half months after the song was released, George Gordon said, Terry Johnson, come in my office. I said, oh, damn. He said, uh, I just have one thing to say to you, Terry. I said, what? Anytime you want to go in the studio, you have carte blanche. Go with, with or without me. Just keep on bringing songs like that to me. And that's the truth. But and I also, big, yeah. wait, 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 wait. so the follow-up to our eyes was me or more. So I wrote that also. Yes, uh, which we got a great clip of that. But I want to ask you something. Um, sure. Why did George say that I Only Have Eyes For You was a hit previously? Yeah, so, but because mine, mine didn't sound like his. Mine didn't sound like, like, like Sinatra's. Or, or any of the people that recorded it, you know, prior to me. Right. Mine was so different. It was so avant-garde that when people heard it, it was like it had a mysterious thing about it. And the harmonies were different and beautiful. The doop chabop that kind of stuff was going on. It was like, it was just, it was, it was meant to be. Well, I think you should know that uh, there was a poll maybe about a year ago, uh, and they put three versions of I Only Have Eyes For You in the poll. Uh, okay. One, of course, was your version. One, of course, was Sinatra's. Yeah. And one, of course, was Art Garfunkel's. Oh, and, I know that from me. Uh, I, 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 my chords, that was my chords. Yes. He, he just left out the doobop chabop and yeah. sang it more straight. Well, he, uh, you guys came out on top, then Sinatra, then Art Garfunkel. <laughs> uh, but it's it's nice that a song uh, could transcend from era to era, genre to genre. That's what makes a great song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that you can have a great singer but give him crap material, and you can have a crap song and give it to a great singer, and it just doesn't work. Right. It, the, the stars and the moons have to be aligned. I'm telling you. We, we were just on uh, last, last year. We were on uh, Sirius. FM on Sinatra's, uh, his daughter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's called uh, Sinatra something. And, uh, seriously, and Sinatra. Yeah, yeah, seriously, Sinatra, right. And she played uh, three or four of his songs. And they did our album of uh, Flamingo Serenade. And then he played the ones of, of Sinatra singing, I Don't Have Eyes For You. And they put mine with it. I was really honored because it sounded so great. You know, the, the new one, the new one that we have out. Not right. the well, they, they did the old one, but then they played the newest one that I have. Right. That's um, reports about it. You had just mentioned the song that you wrote called uh, Mio Amore. Yeah. Uh, now, you were on the album. Uh, you had a song by Doc Thomas. Yeah. Uh, who was one of the greatest rock and roll songwriters yeah, ev ever to walk the face of the earth. Yeah. Um, how, did it, how did it feel as a young man? Young performer, to have your song on the same material list as Doc Pomus, who wrote the soundtrack of rock and roll, and all of the Drifters hits, all the Drifters hits, right. a bunch of Elvis songs, right? All I mean, they were fantastic. I didn't even think about it because life was happening. I was just living life. I had no, you know, I I didn't think, wow, I'm up there with these guys. I didn't even think that it was just happening. I was just a part of part of what was happening. Right. You were doing a lot of one nighters. Oh, too many. Uh, on a bus. Uh -huh. Yeah. Three songs a show, seven shows a day. No. Who told you all that? 
didn't you do the big uh, conglomerate shows where they'd be like 50? But, but not seven shows a day. Oh, no? No, because we were traveling. You know, like we might travel. Like I can remember one with uh, Roy Hamilton, Sam Cooke, Lil Willie John. Uh, 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 I feel good. James Brown. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and like, you know, we would, by the time we got in town and get to the place to change our clothes, it was night. Mm. We would, one show. I can't remember having no, not not a, a lot of shows like that. So, so you didn't do the movie theater stuff where they did a show, then a movie, then a show, then oh, a movie. Oh, but sure, and at the Apollo yeah. Theater was ridiculous. As soon as you come off stage, the half hour was was in. You know, you couldn't really leave the leave the, uh, the theater. Right. So let's we're gonna play a little bit of your composition, uh, Mio Amore. And uh, we're going to get back to that. So, Anthony, video number four, please. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. I, the harmonies. Now, I got to ask you something because I like to ask different questions on my show. Sure. What is that medallion you have on? Uh, that looks like a gold record. My gold record with I only have eyes for you etched in on it. It's this big? <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> that, Listen, that. If, the if the hubcap on your car ever falls off, you can use it <laughs> as a hubcap. You're crazy. And you had a song written by, uh, I mean, when you talk about the upper echelon of any black, it doesn't matter. The music is universal. Right. You did a song written by Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke, yeah. Uh, did you get to spend time with him? Oh, much, much time. I love was Sam he, we was, were he as, was he as beautiful as yes. he seemed really more, more so because when you know him personally he gave you nothing but time and he would sit down with his guitar and play things along with me i'd be playing my guitar and, and that's how uh, uh nobody loves me came out right you know, playing it, but he played it slow and it was beautiful oh because it, la, 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 you know the way he does his stuff and when when we took it to george golden george said yeah but um i i don't think we should do it slow like that i said why he said because Sam Cook is Sam Cook. You know, nobody can sing like him. Say, well, we don't have to sing like him, but the song is good. So no. So he said, I want to make it up tempo. Up tempo. Don't kill the song, George. But it, we did. And it was really our second biggest song that we recorded. Really? So, so yeah. It was the second biggest. Yeah. So it doesn't go, I only have eyes for you. Lovers never say goodbye. Nope. Really? Really? That's news to me, and I thought I knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. Uh, you played the Apollo. You played, when you mentioned the groups that you did before with Roy Hamilton, probably a lot of, uh, I, I don't know what to say. Do I say African-American? I don't know what to say anymore. African-American, man. African-American. Okay. All right. You forgive me. I'm sorry. So sure. you did a lot of African-American venues and shows. Did you ever foray into a white uh, area and feel any type of division, or was music open universally to everybody? Well, let me put it to you like this: uh, most of our audiences were white. That's what was. That's what's strange. Like the Apollo and and the Royal Theater, uh, the Regal Theater in Chicago, uh, the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia. Uh, the song in Washington D.C. They were all they were mainly black, uh, with white whites would come in there. But then, but the rest of the sh audiences that we worked for were white. The big shows, man, with the buses and you know so many different artists in, in these big stadiums. You know they were mainly white. Right. Yeah. 
Did you travel out of the country back then? Did you tour overseas? Not overseas. Okay. No, no. It's too soon for that. Too soon for that. Yeah. Okay. And um, at the point when you were doing this, when you told your your parents you were going to be a traveling musician, what was their response? Well, the mother, my mother was like, oh, baby, no, no, it's too, it's too dangerous out there. No, you need, and my, my father's like, let him do what he wants to do. Let him grow. Let him grow. He loves music. I gave him this guitars and let him do what he wants to do. So it was good. It was good. Full support. And when mom saw you on American Bandstand, did she realize that you made the right decision? Yeah, of course she did. She did. She did. So proud of me, yeah. You know, I'm not a uh, I'm not a hit maker and I'm not an actor on screen and but I do what I love for 40 years and I think that was I think that's what my mother wanted to see. Yeah. You know, my mother once said to me, you can make 5,000 a week selling real estate or 500 a week singing. I'd rather you be happy. Right, that's good. And good isn't it nice to have parents that nurture I'm telling uh, you man. to nurture that I feel blessed, man, because I know so many, so many of my friends, man, they didn't have a father or that, you know, they didn't have a mother or, you know, they had one parent that they had to, but I was blessed. I had both of my parents, my uncles, uncles and aunts, you know, big family. So I, I feel really blessed. What, was any of them musically inclined? My mother could sing sopranos. She had that high voice. Um, my father, he, he, he sang a little bass every once in a while, but and my sisters played piano. Joan played piano. Ruth, she didn't really play an instrument, but yeah. How many siblings did you have? I had a brother and two sisters. It's four of us. That's great. They were probably proud of you as well. Oh yeah, yeah, man. I left uh -huh. Baltimore on fire. I, I I left Baltimore and just. My, a, a whole new lifestyle happened for me, you know, so and I had support of my family, so that was great. I noticed that all your early albums had the word flamingos in them. Was that a marketing ploy to make sure people knew it was you, you guys? or? Uh... Yeah, but uh, I'll put it to you like this. If you think about it, uh, I think the first album was uh, Flamingo Serenade, and that was the picture of the six of us. But then after that, I think George, either he got bad comments about the black group singing this kind of music, because then the next ones had, you know, white kids dancing. And the other one was like a whole big flock of flamingos on this green lawn. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, because it was really prejudice at that time. It was, it was a bitch. It was really hard in those days. You know what I mean? I, I, I experienced a lot of horrifying things that I'll never forget of how bad the South was for black people. You know what I mean? Like whites only. Whites can drink out of this fountain, but blacks got to drink out this one, which is moldy and nasty. And and, I mean, you know, you, can go, you can't go in the same restroom. You can't go in the same restaurant. It was a bitch back in those days. I'm glad I got through it and I came through, you know, Loving you persevered. You, you, perse it. you persevered. I persevered. That's it. And, and you know what's uh, an attest a testament to your uh, character is that it didn't rub off on you the wrong way. Uh, you got people, and I'm not, I'm not disparaging anybody, but you yeah. have people like uh, supposedly, I, I don't know them. You had people like Bill Cosby. Or people like James Brown who said, no, I don't want any white people to work for me. I want to only make my... So you could say that was a little bit of prejudice on their part, but there's a reason. It was a reason. They got pushed to that. Right. And You're, it. You're right. Right. Now, you don't know me, uh, but I'm assuming you knew I was an African-American by my last name. Uh, <laughs> you never met a Denapoli that's... African American, but no, that's no. another reason I want to thank you for doing this show, uh, no, 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 no. because yeah. you 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 really, 
you put a notch in my cap by doing this. Cool. Uh, we got a couple of more pictures of the early days uh, before we get to the little bit in the middle. So, Andy, put up picture number five. So, this was uh, a great shot. Uh, so, at the time, the Flamingos were a six-member group. Right. That's the group... Well, that, that's the group that recorded I Only Have Eyes For You right? and and all, all the other hits for the three albums that we had, four albums that we had. And, and then the, the next picture. This, this picture that you see right there. Yeah. Bootleg. <laughs> bootleg. <laughs> bootleg because those jackets that we wore were like a, a sky blue. <laughs> so somebody stole it and, and, and made the coach red and all that stuff. So I laugh at it, you know, because like I still got paid, even though it's bootleg. You do you, Terry, do you notice the candles all blue? Yeah, oh yeah, right. Check it out. <laughs> oh, you could good, good, good. You saw it. You can get messed up clothes. All right. So we're gonna go to another picture that nobody has anything to say about color. Picture number six, Anthony. Okay. There we go. So this is uh, 1959. Right. Again, six member group. That's right. Uh, that, that's where that harmony and all that stuff came from. From that six that you're looking at right there, we were great. I mean, our harmonies were easy. Everybody knew what to do once I showed them, and we never messed up. But that's the group right there. Now, when you get four people together, uh, in a group, and you yeah. travel. There's uh, there's arguments. When you get five people, there's fist fights. Nah. What happens when six men are together? Was there any anything? That <laughs> <laughs> it was well, six personalities. Well, Nate, Nate, he was know it all, so we called him Lips. Because Nate would always be making fun of people, and he, he would, but but it but you know it it wasn't no real arguments. It was never a real fight in the group, you know, because we, we we knew that we knew who we were, and we knew how we had to carry ourselves. Okay, Anthony, picture number seven. This is uh, 1961. Uh, That's now you I left them. I had left them then. And this is my new group that was called Terry Johnson, the Modern Flamingos. Now, did you have any problems with going with, with doing the Modern Flamingos? No. Okay. Now, because, why seven members? Because, because it, it was, I had organ, bass, drums, and I played guitar and saxophone and sang lead. Now, I noticed that you did that with Nate. Yeah. Who supposedly was the know-it-all. Yeah. So you you, would, yeah. you attach yourself to the know-it-all of the group. Well, he could sing. Nate, 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 Nate was much older than me. I think he was about seven years older than me, and he taught me so much. He would, he would sit down and talk to me about how to, you know, what to do, how to carry yourself, uh, always be busy when you're around girls, you know, always... Mm fixing your cars or doing something, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, just taught me how to really carry myself. And, and what? Oh, right. And after I left and had that group, Nate left the Flamingos also, and he joined forces with me. Right. Yeah. We uh, went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and recorded Let's Be Lovers. Let's Be Lovers. Yeah. It sounded like, it sounded like a, a cross between Lovers Never Say Goodbye and me, and I only have eyes for you. Amazing yeah. song, amazing song. Now, for those of you that are watching this, we, we want you to know that Terry is not talking to the wall. There is a young lady next to him named Teresa Triggs, who is there, but she's off camera. There's our head. We saw her head. We saw her. <laughs> yeah. So. We want to let everybody know that Teresa is a, is a fine vocalist, yeah. uh, a pianist, uh, an arranger, and also your business manager, right. which which I think is another job in itself. It really is. And how long has Teresa been with you in uh, that capacity? 44 years. It'll be 45 years in June. 45 years. 
Yeah. And you never had a fight. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> not really. Not really. You don't have enough time on this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, Teresa, we're going to do another show called The Aftermath of Relationships. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so you broke off. Now, you didn't have much chart success, but not a lot of groups didn't in the 60s due to a little known band called the Beatles. Right. Uh, but you you continued to work. Yeah. Had you to. were doing you were doing I mean, what? All I've, I've never worked any other job in my life except music, singing, music, producing, arranging. That's all I've ever done. So I, I love the Beatles. When they came, I like it it killed American music. Motown was able to hang on there just a little bit by their fingernails. Because the you know the British invasion, they really they took over. But I, I like the Beatles, and I, I like the different style of music that. that right. They, yeah. So what did yeah. you do in the mid '60s? Did you do hotels? Did you do lounges? Did you we do did boy clubs, uh, hotels, uh, supper clubs? Yeah. Right. Uh, we got one of our viewers just sent in a comment. Ask Terry about the Star Glows. That's the group that Nate was with, with me. Right after I had, right, that picture that you showed with me holding the albums, Nate joined me, and we went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Joe Rock, who was the manager and writer for the Skyliners, mm. came to uh, to the uh, supper club we were playing, and he said, "Man, he said, man, you guys sound." He said, "You guys have that sound." He said, "You know, I." Have a song, would you guys like to record? I said, Yeah. So he said, Well, can you write something overnight? Because I, I can get the studio tomorrow. So I said, Damn right. So Nate and I we got together, went back to the hotel and wrote Let's Be Lovers, which is a combination of Lovers Never Say Goodbye and I Only Have Eyes for You. Right. And we went in the studio and it was too much the sound of the flamingos because George Goner's shit, excuse me, sorry, George Goner got so mad. Because he didn't have me, he didn't have Nate, he just had Jake and Zeke and whatever little groups they had put together. And we sounded so much like what our records sounded like with the voice of the lead voices. He had to, he went to Atlantic Records. I don't know what kind of pressure he put on them, but that's it was on the Atco record label. Mm -hmm. And it it came out in Jocko and all the big DJs, they said, Oh my god. This is the sound. These two guys, listen, this is the flamingo. This is the sound. And before we knew it, it was squashed. Right. Big money or, or big pressure from somebody big made it, you know, they, they couldn't let it, they couldn't let it exist. It's always uh, corporate greed that gets in the way of creativity. You're right. You're right. Now you guys started your own label, correct? Yes. And how did that fare for you, being that you had creative control now? Yes, very good. Very good. I love it. How many how many releases did you have back then? Do you remember? Back then? What do you mean back then? When you had your own label. I didn't have it back then. I wish I had. Oh, so you didn't? Gotcha. No, I wish yeah. I had. Man. Dang, when I went to Motown. If I had my own record label, shoot, I probably wouldn't have gone to Motown. <laughs> I want to tell you, I have, uh, God bless Richard Nader. Oh, yeah. I have one of Richard Nader's programs here. Yeah, sure I do. Yeah. And I want to tell you the lineup when you guys played Madison Square Garden. I believe the year was 1975. You were at that show, weren't you? No. You weren't. No. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> let's, let's put that book away. I'm sorry. No, but Rich, but but I love Richard Nader. He he respected us. I mean, you know, and he loved me, uh, especially you know once. You see, I went to Motown in the sixties, so seventy five was impossible for me to have been there because I had, I had, I was just putting my group back together again, so. That had already happened at, at uh, Madison Square Garden with Richard Nader. And then after that, when he found me, he he 
he started booking me again. You know, he's you know, right. he, he loved the group, and right. the, the group that he was booking then wasn't really happening. They not knocking them, but it wasn't what you know. But okay. I, 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 I hear they did a great job, and God bless them. Well, it's a very classy thing you said there. Uh, we got a friend called Sally G. I'm looking he, at him. Yeah, he wants to know if you played Asbury Park with the Orioles. You know he did. You know he did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sally likes to ask questions that he knows the answers to. <laughs> yeah, Asbury Park. I love Asbury Park, man. You kidding me? Happening spot. So uh, you had your own group, 70s. You're doing your thing. Uh now come the 80s, this, the resurgence of the doo-wop music, thanks to Richard, like we said, you guys get brought up to the forefront uh, of, of the shows again. You're no longer a supporting act. You're a main act. Right. Uh, how different was it from the early days? <sighs> I don't know how to put it. Uh, it wasn't that much different. I mean, you know, like the money was a little different. Okay. Uh, it was good. I, I'll put it like that. It was good. It was good. It was a good move. Okay. That's that's a a great end. We've never experienced that uh, response, but I but I think everybody's response is is worth something. Sure. And I like I like the way you said that. It really really. Uh, showed something. I want to play just a little bit of uh, video five, Anthony, because this is you a few years ago uh, doing I'll Only Have Eyes for You. It's just okay. a couple of years ago. So we're going to play this for a little bit for our viewers. Okay. Anthony, number five. So I got to ask you, uh, I don't know. Her. Is that Teresa singing back up for you there? She's back there, yeah. She was directly. So now I, now I know what she looks like. Okay. Yeah, right. Now I could put a face to the hand. Right. <laughs> matter of fact, matter of fact, when we were doing it, she, I don't know. Once, see, we, we did the cruise line. We did uh, Royal Caribbean cruise line for about seven years, and we get left. Do up, we left all that stuff alone. We just had seven different shows that we did, a different show each night. And we we made so much money and was okay, very so, so Terry, tell us what you did on the cruise other than do up. What did you do? A variety. We had a we had we had a 50 show, we had a Motown show, mm. we had a soul show, we had a country western show, we had a 70s show. Uh, we had a 40s show, and um, like and, and, I mean, it was, we had a Let It Go show, which was like, oh, man, you should see us do the coasters. Oh, man, we had a coaster show that just would just stop the show. People just, and we, we would pack it every night. And people didn't even know that I was a flamingo until Teresa would introduce me. We had our own band. It was just Teresa and I out front. And... Uh, when she would introduce me, and I would sing, "I'll have eyes for you." The audience was like, "So it was really great for us." And we stayed there seven years with Royal Caribbean. So you have a lineage of hit songs, yeah. and you don't use that to your advantage, right? I okay. Didn't do. So my, my show, my show was, my show was so hot. I mean, like I'm saying, we would do everybody from the '50s that I knew and more. We would do white and black songs. And it was just combined together. We would do uh, the first show we would do was called Americana of the 60s. It never stopped. It went 35 minutes without a break, without a break. It was just weaved. And the way that, you know, we put it together was just so smooth. And from the first night when an audience came to see us, every night it was jam packed. People couldn't hardly get in there. So it was a very successful time for me because I, I had put the 50s music behind me. It was seemed yeah. like, 
you know, the money wasn't right. You know, what? the money was funny. And, you know, when we got with Royal Caribbean, we were really making good money. So that's why, you know, but then when I came back to the 50s, I mean, to the, uh, the doing the older show, the money was different. It got better. Right. You, know I mean? you got what you felt you deserved. No, so no. Well, no, that's true. That's I shouldn't say it like that. What I deserve. You got with the market bad. Let's put it that okay. way. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, show Anthony show number picks number eight. Now, right now, you've been working with the same guys for yeah. many years. Eight with, years. Uh, eight years. Now that's uh, Starling, Newsom, yeah, and Stan Princeton. Correct. Now, who's on your right? Who's that? On my right is Starling. Starling, and yeah. on the left would be Stan. Uh, yeah. Next picture, Anthony, picture 10. Uh, this is you guys in action. Yeah. This is, you got great, great suits. Great <laughs> suits. Thanks. And Anthony, number 11. Look at this. You are probably on Blackwell's top 10 best dressed list of all time. <laughs> Look at you. Thanks, this man. is fabulous. Thanks. Now, uh, how are the guys? Good guys? Excellent. Love Friend. the music? I mean, for eight years, you know, I don't think we really had a real, real ugly battle or fight or argument. But, you know, of course you're going to have arguments, you know, disagreements, but nothing ugly. They look uh, a little younger. So did they grow up on the music uh, or did you have to teach them? No, Stalin had, Stalin, had, Stalin had his own thing. Uh, he liked all kind of music. His father had him in doing stuff like um, Billy Eckstein. You know, so he grew up with that kind of style of music. And Stan, he was, Stan, Stan had his own little band, and he was working with his band, so he was doing all, all styles of music, too. Great. So, so it's a good marriage. Excellent marriage. Well, you know, we, we love to hear that because we can't wait for the world to reopen so that all of our viewers can yeah. support you and yeah. your group once again. Uh, yeah. Now, a couple of the clips we've showed were from two PBS specials that you were involved in with uh, my music, uh, Rock and Roll at 50 yeah. and uh, the doo-wop cavalcade. Right. Uh, when, when they did doo-wop 50, and they had most of the original lineup. Was that when you were on the ship? No. No. No, that's when I, we, we left the, the cruise line business and started doing our, you know, doing our own shows again. Right. I saw you were probably busy and you just couldn't, you couldn't do it. Well, I did, I did what I had to do. And you did it with spades because I'm going to, I'm going to just run through some of the accolades <laughs> I'm an Elvis Presley fanatic. I, Elvis, I am, too. I am uh, too. Elvis is the only one in four Hall of Fames. You are in the Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame, the Vocal Group Hall of Fame, right. the Doo Wop Hall of Fame, right. and now the Grammy Hall of Fame. What about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? We're going to get to that. Okay. We're going to get to that. But I think that those accolades right there are more representative of how you are to people. Um, mm. To be in the Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame and the Vocal Group Hall of Fame is immense. Then to be in the Grammy Hall of Fame where they only pick a few songs each year. Right. That's big, Terry. That's big. What are you pointing at, my friend? What do you got there? Right there is the uh, award that I got from the Grammy Hall of Fame. Can you do me a favor? Can you please get up? Can you get that off the wall, possible? Can you show our viewers that? Look at this. Look at this. Beautiful. I don't see it. Ah. Wait a minute. There it is. 
Yeah. That's great. That's great. And yeah. congratulations on that. A, a well-deserved award. Thank uh, you. So no. now you wind up, as you mentioned, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. Anthony, put up that very nice picture, number 12. I just love this picture of you. you you'll, you'll, that was the Hall of Fame inductee. I couldn't get the actual one that said uh, yeah. in there. And that was what year? 2001. 2001. Right. 2001, huh? Yep. <clears throat> Have you been to the Hall of Fame after you yeah. wound up there? We went there once. My guitar is still there. I gave him my guitar. So uh, my guitar's in there with uh, Eric Clapton, Jerry who? Oh, Jerry Garcia, um, and a couple others. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What? You're telling me that your guitar yeah. is on the wall or in a case. It's in a case. With, with Eric case. Clapton, yeah. Jerry Garcia, right, and Terry Johnson's. Yeah. As it should be. Thank you. I'm proud you know, of you. On, uh, on I Only Have Eyes for You, that opening lick that you did. Yeah. With your type of songs back then, the guitar wasn't prominent. It was right. strings. It was right. orchestration. Right. Right. So right. so your, your guitar belongs in that Hall of Fame. Because it's so prominent. Thank you. I, I, I think that's... We have comments. People are going to go there now just yeah. to see your guitar. Look at this. I can't believe this. It's this there. is fabulous. Oh, you can see it on my website. It, it's also on my website. You can see it. I got a hello. I got to tell you hello. You might know this person. Kid Kyle. Hey, Kid Kyle. That's Kid my Kyle name. Says, Boy. Terry is one of the nicest and classiest guys in the business. I've known him since he's eight years old. Look at this. <laughs> I love him. He's a beautiful person, man. Yes, That's he is. Him. Yes, he is. So proud of him. I remember he was a little tiny little dude like this. Now he's a grown man. He's being a, an attorney, but still singing his music, you know, being having a music career. I'm proud of him. And I'm sure he appreciates those words. Yeah. Let's talk about the book. Okay. Uh, for our viewers, everything we speak about is available on Terry's website, theflamingos.com. Right. So all the music, I believe there are pictures, but there's a book now uh, that came out a few years ago. Anthony, could you please put the picture of the book up? Last year. Last year. Yeah. I'm sorry. No problem. Anthony? We got a picture. The last picture should be picture 13. There we go. Yeah. Okay. The Flamingos, a clip, complete history of the doo-wop legends. Uh, so you, this is, you wrote this or you ghostwrited it. What, what how did this come about? Uh, Todd had started it years ago because what I liked, what he did with this, he got some input from uh, Jake and Zeke. He got some input from a uh, Nate. He got some input from Tommy Hunt, mm. and he got a lot from me because I I told him the truth of everything from the moment I joined them to when I you know when I left them and what happened after that. So it, it's everybody's stories in there, but uh, most of it is on me of what I've done with my life. And I'm sure it's a wonderful read. Now, they're available on the website, right? You can also get it through Amazon.com. Right. But we want, we want to know if, if any of our viewers buys it from the website and they mention me, will you personally autograph it for them? You know I will. There you got it, everybody. From Terry's mouth, you purchase the Flamingos story from the flamingos.com and you say you saw Terry Johnson on Gene DiNapoli's show, he's going to put pen and paper together and right. personally sign it to you. That's uh, right. Terry, all I can say is for the remaining time 
until forever, your compositions, be it written, guitar, oh. vocals, will live on in infamy. Thank and you. I cannot thank you and your unseen person to hand over there, <laughs> Teresa, for, for taking hi Teresa, for <laughs> taking the time out and entertaining my viewers who are going to support Terry Johnson and the Flamingos from now until no more. So Terry, hope no, you had a great no, time. No, you can't leave me. You can't leave me yet. You can't leave me because you didn't mention any of the stuff that I'm doing. My, my song, oh, I only have for you. That, my, that's song, right. You. That's it's, right. It's, it's happening right now. It's so big. It's all over the world. It's it's on YouTube channel. It's on uh, Facebook. It's on Twitter. It's on You're Instagram. right. And we have it. On we Hot have Facebook. it. Yeah, right. Got it. And Anthony, I want you to play the last video, and then we're going to come back to Terry, and he's going to tell us about the video. You're so right. Forgive me. No See what happens. No Anthony, problem. play the last video. All bright. That's Woo. great. That's great. The video uh, is fantastic. It's beautiful. You got great looking people in there. Uh, in addition to yourself, it's a. It's like a samba beat. Am I correct? It's a. I don't know what, what kind of beat you call it. What, what do I? Latino. Little, little Latino. Latino. Yeah. So yeah. Did, did you think of that? Uh, did you ever no. do that? No, I no. I, Teresa and I wrote a song. We and we would with we, going to Nashville. It was going to be recorded on on uh, Paul Kostovsky's, uh artist, and we went there just to be in the studio while it was happening. And while we were there, we finished the, the song up that fast, and uh, we had about another hour. So he said, "Jimmy," he said. This guy, Jimmy Nichols, he's the one who, who produced that. He said, Terry's here. He said, can you can you change? I don't have eyes for you. Not the way you did it, but give it a feel of its own. And he said, come on in, went, went in, the, in the piano room where he was. He started playing the song, man. I fell in love with it. Like, whoa. So I thought it was fantastic. So they were going to record it on the guy that Paul had you know, brought there to do the other, first song that we we wrote, and he couldn't sing it right. He didn't have the feel for it, so he said, "Terry, go in the, go in the vocal booth and and lay something down for the kid so he can get a, a you know get a feel for it." And I just I was just playing around with it, man. I didn't I didn't even think about what I was doing. I just started singing, and they were. I didn't look at them, and but Teresa took a video of what they did. The, the the producer was, like, "Oh my God, did you have it just look, oh, oh this oh this is how he slurred it. Oh man." And they, when I came out, Paul said, Terry, that song's for you. I said, what do you mean for me? He said, that's you. He said, that's your soul. He said, you got to do it. I said, I'm not recording anything like that right now. He said, Terry, that's your song. So he, he put the money behind it. He paid for the video. He's pushing, he's pushing me now. I have a, I have a whole staff of, of, of media people, uh, a and R people, people that are really, I mean, it's a whole new change of life for me. And it's, I, I thank God and I thank Paul. And that, that's Paul, uh, Paul's Kos last name. Kosovsky. Uh, and that's also uh, Larry Chance's. Larry Chance's manager. Right. Yes. And he is, of course, pushing Larry's country album. Oh, uh, yeah. Larry did. So do you have an entire album or just this one single? Well, we have an album. And what we're doing now, we're let, instead of putting the whole album out right this minute, uh, we're doing one song at a time. Okay. So we, I let Teresa do a song, uh, 2020 Wake Up Call. And uh, then I put out a song I, I wrote with Smokey, uh, Baby, uh, was it? Um, baby, 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 was it? Don't Cry. Yeah, Baby, Baby, Don't Cry. And then I put out um, Never, Walk Never Walk Alone, which is a video kind. And... Uh, we got stuff. Oh man, this the Gene. Let me tell you something. This next song that's coming out in March, March the tenth. I'm gonna send you a copy. I'm, I'm want you to have a copy. It's gonna blow your mind. It's called "Ode to Barry White." Wow! It is so unique. It wow. is so sexy, so romantic, so 
just it just everybody that hears it just and we did it in our show and every time we do it in the show people won't let they won't they, we can't continue on with the show until people stop and they just applaud and applaud stand up applaud 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 and just so it let me say well something good is happening with this let me just put it out so the way it sounds now is just fantastic i'm going to send you a copy of it please do and let us know whatever we could do to to help you promote anything with our show here and our, our TV show, which will be going up real soon. We will be in the Terry Johnson corner. My man. I, I hate um, where where can they buy that one song, right? Now we had so many comments just now. Where do we get it? Where do we get it? Where do we get it? So that's available on the flamingos.com or no? No. No. Uh was it well it's hot on records YouTube, but it's, all, it's really available on you know iTunes. Uh, oh, it's Spotify, available on iTunes, Spotify, Spotify Pandora, okay. and, yeah, all, Pandora, all, 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 all the, the social media. Or, or you can get, but you can get through, you can get it through uh, our, our YouTube channel. Yes, uh, Hot Fun Records. It's streaming and downloading. It's streaming and downloading. Uh, okay. And it's, really, it's doing. I, I mean, I'm I'm so happy, man. I feel like a kid. I mean, it's like another whole shot of life has come back to me, like where this music is really happening for me. And I, that's why I appreciate you, Gene. I really do, man. And I respect you for you because I checked you out, too. I checked out your, your, your resume and things you have done, man. I'm proud of you. You are you're a pro. Thank you, Terry. That, that means the world to me. And I must say that my mother and father were not Elvis fans. My father was a Jimmy Roselli, Frank Sinatra fan, okay. and my mother was doo -wop. Oh, okay. And my mother, my mother, I never forget, you know, you talked about Sonny Till and the Orioles. My yeah. mother would have dances in my living room, <laughs> and the first three songs, I'll never forget it. I Only Have Eyes For You, Crying In The Chapel. Yeah. I get choked up. And okay. out of sight, out of mind. Oh, that's it. By the five keys. So I I grew up on your music oh. and Sinatra. And then Elvis, I became an Elvis fan when I was about six or seven. Yeah. But to hear you say those words about me, my mother and father are shining down looking. Thank you so much. Uh, we are here in your corner. Thank you for these kind words. Everybody's going crazy for your song. Look at this. This is great. We got to get it out of everybody. Spotify, YouTube, whatever this man does, I get behind a million percent. Oh, hi, G oh, hi, Jeanette. That's hi, so, Jeanette. so great. These people are so great. Oh. Um, so let's get back. We got a few more minutes. Okay. Tell me about the ode to Barry White. Did you know Barry? Yes. Yes. Tell me about Barry. Well, I can't tell you about him. I can tell you about the songs. Okay. I'm not going to tell them about the song. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, be quiet. <laughs> no, in other words, the songs are just so romantic. Like, yeah, I I, I did a video with it, and I I, I had to put a little too much. Of Paul just said, "No, no, 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 no," because I I want the people to really hear the songs because the video was just. Gonna it's going to be a surprise. That's all I can say. But I'm, you know Barry White? I'm not going to do it with the video. I'm just going to just let it be. The music speak for itself. Gotcha. The, uh, uh, I mean, the songs are dynamic. I'm not patting myself on the back. It's just it 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 is what it is. Everyone who hears it just freaks out over it. So let me tell you, before you saw Sonny Till in the Orioles and Rudy West in the Five Keys, did you have any influences before them? When you went to that show, with his, was there other music that you were listening to, and then you heard them and you went, "Wow!" Well, see, my parents wouldn't let let me listen to. Uh, we couldn't listen to R and B. Uh, they would play like I, I could listen. To, I could listen to uh, Sammy Davis Jr. I could listen to Nat King Cole, Frank mm. Sinatra, uh, the good music, uh, Billy Eckstein, You know, good music like that, um, and. Arthur Godfrey, like uh, Julius Sarosa, uh, Steve and Edie Gourmet, mm -hmm. uh, the McGuire sisters. That's the kind of music they would play in the house. Wow. But then once once, once a buddy of mine in school invited me over to his house and said, come on, listen to some music. 
And I started hearing this music of Fats Domino and Little Richard and Chuck Berry and said, whoa, where's this coming from? And that's when my mind really expanded for different kinds of music, especially, you know, R&B. Right. Now, you grew up in Baltimore, you said. Um, yeah. Was there any, did anybody come out of Baltimore, any uh, rock and roll early performers uh, come out of Baltimore? Well, Earl Hurley lived down the street. He was from the Swallows. Mm -hmm. um, he from me was Sonny Till. Up the street was uh, J.R. Bailey. He was with the Cadillacs and myself. Wow. Yeah, so it was four people on the one block in Baltimore that was really big in showbiz. That sounds like the block where Bobby Rydell and Fabian and Frankie yeah, Avalon came yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you ever go back to Baltimore? Uh, really. Really? I'm too busy, you know, especially now I'm I'm there. Yeah. in Nevada, you know, it's like. Right. And flying right now, I'm not crazy yeah, about doing that. I don't blame you know. you. I'm in Baltimore every December. We yeah. do a show. Yeah, we do a show for the John Hopkins Children's Hospital. What? Yeah, I was yeah, born to John Hopkins Hospital. Well, you really? Yeah. Yeah, we, we do an Elvis show for them for about 20 years, and we raised about 14 or $15 million over the course oh, of the 20 left. years. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. That's yeah, beautiful. So we love Baltimore, and we love the Flamingos, and we love Terry Johnson. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we do every week, let's give this man and that lady the proper way to go out as an entertainer. Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Johnson and Teresa Trey, give them a big round of applause. Yes. Woo! Terry, God bless you. You there? I think we lost you. Thank you, my friend. You got it. Yeah. Stay well. Your, 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 your friend, your, your, free, your friend is freezing. I, you're freezing. Okay. <laughs> Listen, stay warm, no, stay no, safe, no. and God bless you. Brother. All right. Wow. What a show, huh, everybody? I mean, you're talking about an originator of uh, the doo-wop sound, the flamingo sound. Uh, just so much great stuff. We got a couple of minutes. I want to tell everybody uh, about next week's show. And then I got some personal good news. So uh, uh, next week, uh, even though Elvis month has ended, we were so fortunate to get one of Elvis's backup singers in a group called the Sweet Inspirations. The young lady's name is Estelle Brown. And uh, there she is. That's Estelle with her group, her group today, which is Miss Portia Griffin, and Estelle being uh, touched on the shoulder by Elvis. Uh, this young lady and her group, when we tell you next week the amount of recordings uh, that she has been on with the Sweet Inspirations and the recordings themselves, you're going to be amazed because she is not just rhythm and blues and gospel and soul. So we're going to leave that to next week. Uh, so, you know, make sure you uh, you check us out. Don't forget, share us. You can see this on all our pages and on YouTube. Go to YouTube, type in my name, Gene DiNapoli, and please subscribe to my channel because if I get to a 1,000 uh, subscribers, I could start to do bigger and better shows. And that's what we're hoping to do. Get more likes on the reminiscing page. Get more viewers on the YouTube. Subscribe on the YouTube, on the Instagram. Uh, now, a uh, couple of things happened to me the past few weeks I'm very proud of. Uh, first of all, uh, a horror movie that I have a very small part in came out on Amazon called Conjuring the Devil. And for two weeks in December... It was the most streamed horror flick of Amazon. Very proud of that. And then uh, a movie I did back in October with Chris Cerrone, who played Henry Hill in Goodfellas. It's called Pumpkin Hole. That'll be coming out in a couple of months. And I just got cast to be Elvis Presley in a play 
in a festival in the city. Now, being that the city is closed, this play will be done without an audience, but they are going to stream it. So we will have all the information on all the pages. Uh, I think it might be free or it might be a nominal fee to watch the play. It's either the first or second week of March. And we hope that you tune in. It's about a boy's coming of age with Elvis as his guardian angel. And I was so honored to uh, audition for the role and to get it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, to be cast in that play, I think the name of the play is going to be Jason and Elvis. It's a short play, uh, <laughs> which has nothing to do with my height. It's got to do with the, the time frame because everybody says, you know, is it because you're short? Um, some great stuff coming out. We did a uh, we did a song uh, with Estelle Brown and Portia Griffith called "He's Alive" about Elvis, written by the great Butch Barbella, uh, and that song is being mixed right now for release on iTunes and Amazon and Spotify. That'll be out in, in the next three weeks. So for those of you that have seen my show and see that I do it live, uh, it'll be a chance for you to purchase it. Uh, it'll be the first time that the Sweet Inspirations back up a Elvis artist like myself on a commercial release uh, in many, many, many years. So I'm very proud that the young ladies did that. We got some great shows coming up on uh, February 8th. Of course, we have... Uh, Estelle Brown, like we said, on the 15th, we have uh, Norman Fox of the Rob Roy's who did a song called Tell Me Why and Dream Girl and Pizza Pie. And then on the 22nd, we have another original rock and roller. We have <laughs> this guy's sax lines are legendary from a group called Bill Haley and the Comets. We have the sax man, Joey D'Ambrosio, coming to us live, which we are so proud and so honored that Joey uh, has agreed to do our show. Uh, an originator. Bill Haley and the Comets, an originator of rock and roll. Uh, just so much wonderful stuff. We got a couple of more yeses today which will be on the page reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli. So go to the page on Facebook and uh, follow it so you know who's going to be up so you don't miss it. Uh, also, don't forget, if you missed it, you could go back to YouTube and any one of our pages and re-see the show. It's live in case you want to comment. That's great. But if you miss it, it will uh, it'll be seen and shown. And we can be heard on ItalianAmericanRadio.com. And I'm very proud to say that my shows, Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli, has just been approved to be put on Roku, which is a streaming service all over the world. So in a couple of weeks, our shows will be uploaded. And <laughs> thank you, Jeanette. And people will see our shows around the world and we hope that they enjoy them as much as we do in, to do them and hopefully they'll support all our guests like Terry Johnson and Ron Dante and everybody that has something to sell, Billy Vera let's talk about our sponsor Valentine's Day is a couple of weeks away and for those of you that cannot be with loved ones or you have family members sides flowers and baskets by Anthony's gift baskets. Who's another sponsor of our show. They do gift baskets. We now have bacon bits. NYC. Our friend Allison makes probably some of the best iced cookies on the planet. I should know because I eat 20 of them a night when I could get them. So she has different chocolate packages for you. They're available in a size small, which called the little crush. The medium is called 
tearing up my heart. And the large is called Unbreak My Heart. And they're all available in different sizes. She also has what's called hot cocoa bombs, which I'm going to have one tonight. You put it in hot milk. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you put it in milk and they blow up. And I want to thank my friend Dan Barella for turning me on to those. And she also has our favorite chocolate-covered strawberries. So go to our website, baconbitsnyc.com. You can order from there. Mention you saw her on the Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli podcast. Maybe she'll give you an extra strawberry or an extra pretzel. But it'll let people know that if they sponsor our shows, it does work for them. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go out with the newest hit song, the current 2021 version of the Flamingos hit, I Only Have Eyes For You. See you next week at 7 o'clock. Until then... Be safe, stay well, stay positive. God bless you. And let's go out, Mr. Terry Johnson, and a big hit. I'll only have eyes for you. Thank you, Anthony. See you next week.